There's some names I recognise. Okay, perfect. I'm checking. Okay, so good evening, everybody, and good afternoon for those who are joining us from the US. Welcome to our fourth um, event on Bridging the Atlantic Diaspora Dialogues. Uh, this evening will be a conversation with uh, Stella Dazi and Daisha, Daisha Brabham. Before I introduce them though, I would like to just allow my colleague, Karis Morris Brown, to say a few words to us. So Karis is our uh, workforce development manager. And a couple of weeks ago, there was, I, there was a question in one of these events about our Pathways into Arts and Heritage, which is a new initiative we'll be setting up to encourage young people to consider the arts and heritage as a career and to assist those already working in that sector to, to, to get into the boardrooms at strategic level. Karis also looks after our volunteers and our members. So over to you, Karis. Hi, evening everyone, or good afternoon, good morning. I don't know the times in America, but um, welcome to Black Cultural Archives. Um, I suppose there's lots of things that I want to tell you, but I'm aware that I only have five minutes to speak. Um, so maybe I'll start with the Pathways event. So this year on the 7th of September, we'll be um, running our second BCA Pathways into the Arts and Heritage Sector event. Um, on the day we will have speakers who are leaders in the sector talking about their journey and it's to encourage those of us that may not have thought that it's a place for us to realise that there is a space for us, that we have our voices and our stories to be told and they're told so much with so much more impact when we get to do that. So it's a great day to learn about other people that have done that journey and how you can be a part of the sector too. I also want to thank you for um, joining this event and we hope to continue to run more and more events like this. And the only way that we can do that is with the support of individuals such as yourself um, financially supporting us. So after I stop talking, I will put a link to our Just Giving page. Um, and there you'll be able to set up either a one-off donation or a monthly donation so that you can continue to see the work of BCA, um, not just online, but when we reopen, which is going to be in the very near future, um, you'll be able to see all of that work too. I've also been asked to let you know about our really amazing event, almost as amazing as this event, which is happening tomorrow at... 7.30 um, where we'll be speaking to the producer of The Real McCoy. So The Real McCoy was a comedy series that went out on the BBC I believe in the early 90s. I just about remember watching some of the episodes so it'll be great to hear about some of the creative minds behind that um, and just learn about what they're doing in the future too. I'll also put a link down below. Thank you. Karen. Enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. So the so topic is today is award defining black in Britain. So Stella Darcy is a published writer and historian best known for the, her book, The Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain, which won the 1985 Martin Luther King Award for literature and was republished by Verso in 2018 as a feminist classic. Her forthcoming book, A Kick in the Belly, Women, Slavery and Resistance, is due to be published by Verso in October 2020. She is a founding member of OWAD, the Organization of Women of Asian and African Descent, which is a national umbrella group for black women that emerged in the late 1970s as part of the British Civil Rights Movement. She was recently described as one of the grandmothers of black feminism in the UK, and her personal archive is held at Black Cultural Archives. And it's one of our most visited um, and research collections by researchers and scholars. Her career as a writer, artist and education activist spans over 40 years. She has written numerous publications and resources aimed at promoting an inclusive curriculum and good practice with black adult learners and other minorities. 
including resources to decolonize and diversify the UK national curriculum in schools and colleges. She's well known within the UK for her contribution to tackling youth racism and working with racist perpetrators and is a key contributor to the, to the development of anti-racist strategies with schools, colleges and youth services. In November 2003, she received the Network for Black Managers Award for outstanding contributions to race equality in further education. She has run workshops and spoken at conferences in Germany, Slovenia, Poland, Norway, South Africa, the USA, Hong Kong and Malaysia, and was a guest lecturer at Harvard University in 2018. She appeared in And Still I Rise, a documentary exploring the social and historical origins of stereotypes of African women, and was a guest of Jermaine Greer on her BBC Two discussion programme, The Last Word. She was also a commissioner on the Mayor of London's African and Asian Heritage Commission, which aimed to promote more diversity across London's heritage sector. So towards the, welcome Stella. Thank you. <laughs> towards the end, I will, I will post a link of, of, of some of Stella's works for those of you that would like to do some further, further reading. And also a welcome to Daisha, who obviously we've seen her every week, but I don't think I've ever formally introduced her. <laughs> so, so, sorry. So Daisha Bram is a historian, educator, and writer from New Haven, Connecticut. She received her bachelor's from Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven and her master's from Royal Holloway University of London in Egham. As a historian, she focuses on the evolution of blackness throughout the diaspora. In 2017, she wrote and produced her play, Homecoming, a her story of black womanhood a choreographed play that tells the story of black women throughout the diaspora. In 2019, she launched the Homegoing Internship, which allowed students to put on the production of the play. All of the proceeds were <coughs> organizations to fund black women's education. In 2019, she was awarded the prestigious US-UK Fulbright Award to receive her master's. During that time, she was also awarded the Fulbright Barzun Prize for the Homegoing Internship. Which, which grants 10,000 US dollars to projects that focus on youth in the UK. Due to coronavirus, the play is now scheduled to debut in London in 2021. As an educator, she has worked on curriculum with the Yale New Haven Teachers Institute on teaching race in the classroom. She has also been working on different fiction writing and public history projects due for release in 2021. So the, the, the format of, of the evening, we'll be, I'll be facilitating a discussion between Stella and Daisha. After 45 minutes, we'll have a short break during which we will have a link there to the, our BCA's exhibition, which is launched on the Google Arts and Culture platform, where we'll be able to see some of the work of, of Awad and, and, other, and the Black Women's Movement to look at, and then we can reconvene and discuss more of that followed by questions and answers. So without further ado, so let's launch into the, the discussion. Um, could I ask, by ask, uh, ask, sorry, start by asking you, Stella, about um, be before, before you set up a word, um, something about the history of black women's organizing. I mean, what inspired you and who were the role models that inspired you to, to, to set up a word? Um, I think OAD was a pragmatic response to a need that arose um, as we saw more and more small community-based black women's organisations operating around the country and um, a presence of black women in other organisations that weren't specifically for women and felt an, a, a growing need to have some kind of umbrella organisation that would allow us to speak if not with one voice, with a collective voice. Um, so that's really the context with which OAD was, was, was established. I know at the time um, there were quite a lot of women's groups springing up within broader organisations that had men often as the spokespeople or as the um, self-appointed leaders. And there was a degree of frustration uh, among a lot of women that their voices weren't being heard or the issues that were affecting us as black women weren't really coming to the fore. And I think all those forces combined to encourage a number of women, I was just one of them, 
to come together to think about how we could we could organize in a way that was both women friendly but also um, rooted in a particular kind of politics and when I say that I'm talking about a politics that both reflected our links with the countries we came from our countries of origin which connected the struggles that we were experiencing here with struggles overseas the liberation struggles in Africa um, come to mind but there was anti-apartheid there were all kinds of things going on at the time and one of the early lessons that we were given by women who hailed from that background um, was to not allow ourselves to be subsumed within a male organization, that we should set up something independent that we ourselves controlled and, and um, which didn't require us to be, um, you know, deferential to anybody else. And I think that's an important context for OAD because I've certainly read quite a lot of analysis of OAD over the years. And one of the misconceptions is that somehow it came as an offshoot of what was happening within the white women's movement. And certainly that wasn't my experience. It may have been the case for other women, but for myself, it was certainly grounded in a, a, an African liberation context, which recognized the need for women to have self-determination. Mm -hmm. So that, that that last point you said about the African context. Um, so I, I did. I heard that you were actively working with with African women in the African on the African continent. Is that correct? And if so, did you did you find that um, they had similar cultural and political imperatives, or were they? Were they I, I don't think that's actually true. Um, what I was doing was working <laughs> with a group called African Red Family, which was trying to support liberation struggles in Africa. But I was based here, um, mm -hmm. and I did go to various events and speak on behalf at the time of, of, of Ghanaian women and, and what was happening in Ghana, which is where my father hails from. But no, I wasn't working directly with women in Africa. I was very mm -hmm. much based here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Daisha, yes, so I know you've, you've been doing a, a lot of research on, on OWAD. Um, could you, can you just tell us a little bit about what it was that, that, that struck you first when you started to, to encounter this material? What, what was the most inspiring thing that you found about it? Yeah, so I um, actually, it was part of a course. My, my course, um, it was a term paper that I was writing on um, the newsletters of OWAD or FOWAD. And I thought that um, when I first kind of encountered the text, I thought, I think what was most interesting to me were kind of two points. The first point was this this use of the word black and the use of the term blackness um, and how it had been used in Britain. Because as an African-American, blackness kind of meant one thing here. And being kind of going to London, it turned into an entirely new thing. And it was much more inclusive, I, I, I feel. At least I'm only speaking to my experience being an African-American um, growing up in my region. And it's interesting, I kind of, thought to myself, um, I, I, Miranda Kaufman, the Black Tudors, said that in her research of looking at the early modern period, she found hundreds and hundreds of different terminologies for the term Black. And that there, because there's so much, we use this term so often, I was just so interested in how OWAD in particular wanted to use Blackness as a way of collectivizing. Um, to be able to be inclusive of all of these different voices that had been organizing in the UK at that time. And so that's kind of what first drew me to the newsletters and it's reflective in every single one of the, every single one of the newsletters that I looked at. Um, so that was the first part. And then I also, I think what also drew me was this inter, this across the Atlantic connection. Um, one thing, and I'm, I'm sure that I'm, um, you can speak to this, Miss um, Stella, the fact that in all of the readings that were suggested at the end of the newsletters, I saw Toni Morrison, I saw Angela Davis, I saw all of these African-American women. So there was almost the sisterhood or in my own, I guess, a, a special relationship between the US and UK that I, as growing up, I had never seen. Um, and I thought that that was what 
it, it kind of, in, it, it warmed my heart to see those connections that had always been there throughout the diaspora. And this is happening in the 70s, but also looking back to the 50s, the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, there's always been a connection between Black communities. Um, and I think that OWAD kind of defined that for me. Um, so mm. I think that's what really drew, drew me to the newsletters myself. Mm. Thank you. And then, so with, with that in mind, what would you say, Stella, were the unifying factors? Because we talked about how Blackness was understood quite differently and included a range of people from different African countries, Caribbean, Asian. What would you say were the, yeah, the, the unifying factors between all of these women within OWAD? Well, you know, I think it's important to remember that OWAD didn't start off with that, you know, vision of diversity. Um, it evolved as we came to grips with the issues that we wanted to address. And certainly when we started out, um, we had intended to call OAD the Organization of Women of Africa and African Descent. So we already had that kind of sense of the African diaspora. And my recollection is that um, at the time, a young Asian sister attended one of our meetings, um, bearing in mind, of course, that in Britain in the 70s, what you had was a lot of Asian people coming from the African continent um, because of what was happening in East Africa, in Tanzania, Uganda, etc. So this young sister not only completely um, ruined my stereotypes of Asian women because she arrived in motorbike le leathers and absolutely, you know, didn't, didn't fit the stereotype, but she said, what about us? And um, I suppose you can understand that question in one of two ways. Partly, what about us who hail from the African continent but happen to be of Asian descent? But also, what about those of us who hail from, who are of Asian descent, who live in this country and who experience racism, sexism and other forms of oppression in a way that may not be exactly the same as women of African descent, but certainly comes from the same source. And I think it was the discussions we began to have around that that led us to realize quite quickly, quite early on, if you look at the uh, the, the archive at the BCA, you'll see some, you know, scribbled handwritten notes where we literally had to change it by hand. Obviously, we didn't have um, access to the, the, the resources that people do today. Um, but very early on, we realized that actually it was important to make common cause. Now, I think that that was also inspired to some extent by the fact that some of us would have identified ourselves as Marxists and saw the importance of internationalism. Um, we had already encountered people of Asian descent in the context of work we were doing in trade unions and other organisations where, again, the issues that faced all of us were coming to the fore. So it was a kind of natural alliance. In terms of the, the comment you were making, Daisha, about political blackness, so what was called in those days political blackness, I think it was very easy out of that context to think of blackness, not so much in terms of skin color or skin gradations or a particular continent, but actually in terms of people who, because of their appearance, experienced racism or could experience racism. And that both became a unifying factor, but it also enabled us to make common cause where we could. Now, um, if you look at the structures within OAD, because most of the women who were attracted to OAD were also working or involved or based in local communities. Um, obviously the issues that came up in those communities were the things they were addressing and sometimes they connected, sometimes they were different. But by making common cause, we were also able to offer each other solidarity. And I think if you look at FOAD and you look at the issues that come out through the no newsletter, this is something that you're acknowledging, Daisha, that you know, um, you can see very easily where the connections were. Um, Asian women, for example, were experiencing for a period of time um, virginity testing at, at the ports of entry in this country. They literally had to spread their legs and prove that they were virgins because of some stereotypical misconception that Asian women would only want to come here to join a husband for the purpose of marriage. Um, so that kind of horror was, was being encountered by Asian women, whereas women of African and Caribbean descent were encountering all kinds of restrictive legislations and hoops that we had to jump through, which often split our families asunder 
or made it very, very impossible for us to survive here. So um, in the same way as, you know, when you look at uh, African American women and we can see so much that we have in common, but also so much that we have that we can identify as differences. I think that that applies across the African Asian divide. And I think actually nowadays it's even more important for us to, to acknowledge that because there's so much divide and rule and there's so much navel gazing that comes out of a kind of identity politics. It's all about, you know, people who look like me and people who, who, who eat the same food or, you know, watch the same network, Netflix programs, whatever, you know, um, that becomes, it becomes very easy for us to sort of disappear into our own silos. So I, I think that that principle of African Asian unity and of political blackness is an important one for us to revisit as we, you know, engage with the issues that, that concern us today. Mm, definitely. And I don't know if I can kind of tag onto that. And I think that's something that I received in reading the in reading the newsletters and also just doing an analysis, a brief, the brief analysis that I was able to do in the seven months that I was in the UK of understanding blackness as a transitional Ver, it's a transitional word it transitions you into this world at least for me because that's all I think growing up here I always felt it tied to culture right and in saying that I always I think I always felt that oh you have the skin colors me you have the same culture we're the same culturally we have those same um characteristics when in reality again there are similarities but there are also distinct differences and so viewing blackness as a transitional word um, I think is really important, especially in this context, which I know we'll come back to later, and especially in the context of Black Lives Matter, especially in this context of Black liberation, what does that look like? And I also think, kind of tagging onto what you said, which is, which is what is reflected in the newsletters, is the fact that the issues that were being discussed were so, were not the, so much theoretical. They were very practical. You were talking about the sus laws. You were talking about the census. You were talking about birth control. All of these are not that they aren't theoretical, but they weren't kind of just talking about patriarchy in vague or broad terms. They were actually getting to the heart of what black women were dealing with at that time. And I think that's an important distinction, when it, at least for me, again, in not aligning OAD or not aligning black women's movements to white women's movements. Cause to me, I saw that as a distinct difference that I had saw when I encountered the archive. Thank you. And, and Stella, what would you say were the greatest impacts? I mean, I, I forget how long Awad was actually um, operating for, but during that period, what would you say were the biggest impacts maybe um, of the time, but also moving forward? I think it's really hard to say, to be honest, because Awad, was of its time and like all political organizations it had its moment and it came about because it was needed at that time um, so it was relatively short-lived but it had a huge impact and I think it had an impact in a kind of subliminal way um, you can look at the campaigns that we got involved in and um, the kinds of things that we were doing to try to challenge um, our lack of civil rights in, in the UK context. Um, for example, you know, the, the, the SUS campaign, which I suppose to some extent has been replaced by Stop and Search, but to some extent was a successfully fought campaign. Certainly um, our campaigns around um, uh, what was happening in our schools and, and what was happening to children in our schools, there were some very, very effective black parents movements, which had a predominant presence of black women. I know in my local community, we set up a pressure group that, that really did challenge some, some bad practices in, in, in our local area. There are all kinds of small but significant um, successes. We even ran a campaign locally. I'm just thinking back now um, because there was something that happened similar quite recently um, where our local group challenged a local public house to take down a sign outside of the pub was called the Black Boy Pub. And it had this really grotesque image of a little black pickaninny with great fat lips and a 
and a grass skirt, which our children walk past every day. And we said, no, we're not having that. Now, you know, you can look at something like that in the scheme of things and say, you know, it's a drop in the ocean. But it was all this stuff going on together that was, you know, beginning to have an impact on the body politic. But I think, you know, in answering your question, Asia, what was most Im impactful was actually the grounding it gave for the, all those women who came into our meetings, who attended conferences, who knew people who, who were in the local women's groups, because even when OAD no longer held those events and was seen to be in existence, those women took those messages on, took them forward, took them into the schools, into the local authorities, into their professional capacities, into their homes, into their child rearing, into their friendships and their relationships, into the work they did in other countries, in all kinds of ways. And you can still see, I can anyway, the impact of some of the things OAD was doing in not just my generation, but actually in future, in, in younger generations who've come, come along since. That's really, yeah, that's really inspiring. If, if you look at it in terms of a continuous chain rather than different organisations stopping and different ones, ones starting. Yeah. I was just going to say, I read a quote the other day, um, which I thought sort of summed it up. And it, it said something like, um, our lives are written in ink, which is bequeathed to us. Mm. And it really resonated like with that, me yeah. because I think, you know, um, as, as Daisha mentioned earlier, um, nothing is new, you know, in, in this black feminist struggle, in this anti-racist struggle, in the Black Lives Matter context, nothing is new. And we have to, if we're to learn and we're to grow, we have to remember that we are standing on other people's shoulders and that we are here today because of something that someone did before we came. That's all really important. And it, it not only inspired the work um, that was done that, that led to the heart of the race. And I should mention my co-authors because you, you presented it as if it was just oh. my book. Obviously, uh, Suzanne and, and Beverly, we wrote the book together and there were other women who had an input in the, in the early days. So um, I've kind of lost my thread, but yeah, I, I think um, all those things are, are worthy of, of, of remembering. And mm. certainly they underpin the narrative of both books um, that, that we're talking about tonight because they speak in women's voices and they speak to women's lived realities. Definitely. And I think if, if we remember that, as, as you said, we stand on the shoulders of giants, it stops each generation from trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, there's so much that people are doing without realising, oh, someone's actually done that before. And there comes that moment when people suddenly start to think joined up. And I think that's the moment that impact mm. starts to, to take place. But um, yes, mm -hmm. sorry, Daisha. And I was just going to say, and I think that's something that we, like you said, that needs to be reminded but I also think it's baked into the diaspora in many ways when I was reading Heart of the Race one thing that kind of got to me was when I was reading the first chapter everything was in first person all of the struggles that had black women had gone through all the ways that we had resisted was all in all in first person as in we have always done this we have always done that and I think that that's something to keep in mind and that it is kind of baked into our political organizations or our social cultural organizations that the, is that there is a consistent groundedness in the past as a way of informing the present um, and, I, and like I said I, I took that from part of the race as well I want to make sure I mentioned that mm, right. Um, I was going to ask about your next book, but actually I think we could spend a bit more time on The Heart of the Race. I'm not sure how much the audience are familiar with it, but could you say a bit more, Stella, about how the three of you came to write it and, and just, yeah, a bit more about the, the book itself? Yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier that, um, Daisha, that you'd seen references to Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and people in, in FOAD, and um, certainly my journey involved um, way back when, uh, reviewing some of those books for Virago and um, reading them with a view to recommending whether they should they were worth publishing here. So I had a field day and man managed to read some of those books long before they were generally available. But through that relationship, I got to know some of the women at Virago. And I should say, for those of you who don't know, Virago in those days, at least, was a feminist publishers, a women's publishers and try to focus on books by women and about women. 
And they had recently um, published a very successful book by an author called Amrit Wilson, an Asian sister who was also part of OAD, um, called Finding a Voice, which looked at the journey of women of um, Asian descent from the Asian subcontinent and from East Africa who had come to Britain and what they'd experienced. And Virago approached me with, with the question, could we produce something similar? And because I was part of this collective, um, it was very much um, a natural thing for me to take it back to the group and say, what should we do with this request? And it did actually start off as, as, as a book collective. Um, we put out a call, we said anyone who wanted to be involved, you know, to come to the meetings. But I think anybody who's ever tried to put a book together, we realised that it's not that easy to do. And the more people are involved, the harder it is to actually speak with a collective voice. But I think it was more to do actually with the fact that a lot of us were juggling childcare, careers, early relationships, you know, studies, all those other things. So slowly the group whittled down. And before we knew it, it was myself, Gerlin Bean and Beverly Bar Bryan. Then, of course, we had what was going on in um, Zimbabwe um, come to the fore and Gerlin decided she wanted to go and support um, the young Zimbabwean state and Suzanne came on board. So it was a kind of quite fluid start to the process. But in the end, the three of us were the ones who, 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 who put it together. And I think um, it's fair to say that that first chapter began, no, not even the first chapter, the introduction of ties that, uh, the ties that bind began as quite an academic piece. Um, but at some point, um, we realized that what was most important about this history was that we owned it, that it was ours. And by using that collective we, we were able to say to our prospective or perceived readership who were primarily black women, listen, you know, this is our history. This is ours, we own it. This is what happened to us. And I suspect that the success of the book and its resonance 30 years on has a lot to do with that because um, hopefully, you know, whatever age women are, whatever their background, they can connect with that we, they can see themselves in the realities that are being presented. Mm. And also, I mean, it's, it's really a seminal text now for, in universities as well for anybody studying Black British history. So, I mean, was that an audience that you thought of as well? Like, was it, as you say, you wrote it for Black women's experiences, but did you ever imagine that other people would be reading it and, and learn what they would be taking from it? Well? I, I guess we must have, but I'm, I'm not really, I don't really remember us thinking too much about who was going to read it other than, you know, we needed to tell our story and we needed to do that story justice. Um, I know that when the book was first published, there were academics who, who said, you know, this isn't proper history, you know, women talking about their lives, what earth, whatever next, you know? And, um, you know, we stood our ground. We, we, we recognize that oral history is absolutely vital. A, because we come from oral cultures, but B, because how else can you tell a history that's been hidden or a history that's been hidden? It's, it's, it's impossible to do. So I don't think we were sort of worried about an academic audience or even primarily thinking about them, but um, certainly we wanted to present a straightforward, down-to-earth, accessible analysis that would be readable by anyone who picked the book up. And I don't know, certainly for me, it was really important that the book was accessible to people who weren't university educated and who didn't necessarily, you know, um, have a string of long words to um, fall back on. People from our communities, ordinary women, you know, should be able to pick up that book and see themselves in it and read it easily without, um, you know, having to have a dictionary beside them. And I think, and sorry, just to pick up on that, I think another thing that I think is interesting is that, and again, this is not only with Heart of the Race, but also just your, your archive at BCA, is the fact that it's, it's tied to this collective and that you can't, there is no one person that you can kind of discuss without talking about the other. And I think a lot of times when we talk about movements, especially in the aftermath, or we talk about the legacy of movements, we always want to tie it to one person, or this is the person who really stood out. And it's something that you kind of get whenever you come front the archive is you cannot do that you cannot tie it from yeah, I'm really glad you said that Daisha because um, I think 
you know, I, I'm seeing how um, very easy it is for people to buy into this celebrity culture. And I know certainly in terms of the marketing of, of my forthcoming book, you know, I've read things like the giant of black feminism. And it, it makes me cringe, to be honest with you, because I'm no more of a giant than any of the other women who were involved in that movement, who were involved in that process and who who played their, their part. And some of those women, as is always the case in black women's history, are anonymous and won't be named and won't be known. But they were there and they need to be acknowledged and they need to be remembered. So, um, you know, my role, I feel I've always been an educator. I've always been a teacher and I've always seen it as important to capture that history, to tell it, to retell it, to make sure that it was accessible to the widest possible audience. Otherwise, I cannot see the point of all that knowledge and all that history. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to move on to the, the other topic of, of education. You're both educators and you've both um, dealt with topics of anti-racism in education. Um, I mean, I'm not even sure what my question is. It's such a huge topic, anti-racism in education. But I, I did notice that in, in, in reading your bio, Stella, that you said you've worked with, uh, maybe I misunderstood it. Did you say you, you work with racist perpetrators? Yes. Um, I can't imagine what how that would have come about or what <laughs> it's like. And maybe you've got some sort of words of wisdom you could share with us on. Yeah, I'll tell you, because, you know, racism is a two-way street, you know, and... Uh, there was some money available back in the day, I think it was early 90s, from the Home Office. Um, it was made available to work with young people who were committing racist attacks in a particular area of London. It was the area of Southwark called Bermondsey. And we're talking about um, young people who would set um, a woman's sari alight at a bus stop or pelt people with rotten eggs or physically attack them. And the incidence of these attacks was rising. So we developed a project um, under the auspices of a local youth agency to work with these kids through det detached youth workers um, to begin to create an alternative narrative for them. Because you're talking about kids who were raised often in homes where racism was so casual that nobody really challenged it. Um, kids who may or may not have gone to school, if they went to school, they certainly weren't learning anything about uh, multicultural Britain or the reason why Britain was so diverse. If they didn't go to school, they were often attracted to far right organisations who, who offered them some kind of ownership, uh, belonging or, 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 or tribal um, identification. So you're talking about kids who quite often had never heard anyone challenge the kinds of views that they had. And in a detached youth work project, those of you who will remember good practice, <laughs> good, good youth work practice, which has pretty much died these days, there's no youth clubs anymore. Those of you who remember it will remember that to do detached youth work, you literally had to pound the streets. You literally had to get the kids um, on side by connecting with their interests, by trying to, um, through the kids, work with the parents and through the parents work with the community. And we did all kinds of interesting things. We would, for example, we organized um, a visit to the local prison where our criteria with the prisoners that they met was that there must be a black and a white prisoner together talking about their experience. And of course, these kids went in with huge bravado thinking, oh, you know, I'd wing it if I was in here. And by the end, those old prisoners were telling them, listen, you know, if you come in here, you'll cry like a baby for your mother. And what was happening was through seeing the shared experience of the prisoners, um, the kids were able to see that actually race was not a factor. It might have been a factor in terms of the sentencing, but certainly in terms of the experience of being imprisoned, it was horrendous for everybody. And that some unusual alliances formed as a result of that imprisonment. So that was an example of one of the things. We also took them to France on a day trip and let them negotiate the whole immigration pro process just so that we could have a discussion with them about their perception that it's really easy to walk in and out of the country and claim benefits and be a scrounger, which is still part of the, you know, the discourse that you hear um, from the far right. So <clears throat> it, we worked in a very subliminal way over a period of three years and it really made an impact. 
it really did make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, it allowed children to have ways to challenge the views of their parents, to challenge teachers, but also to get a sense of self and a sense of who their natural allies were. Because of course, a lot of these kids are working class kids and they had the same issues, the same isms, the same oppressions on many fronts as working class black kids. So um, it was really important to kind of shine a light on that shine a light on their own origins, which obviously often were two or three generations back of Irish or Polish or some other extraction. Those kinds of things all came out, came into the mix. And I think it was one of the most successful projects. I actually wrote it up as a book called Blood, Sweat and Tears, which um, I'm not even sure you can get it anymore, but uh, it was an interesting piece of work. Just writing that down. It, it, it is interesting because like you like you said about it being, you know, these are working class people who, who share similar struggles. And from what I see when I look at um, sort of black liberation movements, that there's, that's something that's always been very much evident. So it's, it's they have a Marxist um, political overview and that involves um, uniting with, pe with working people from all different backgrounds. And I think I saw that, that's what I saw reflected in a lot of the material in the interest that you had in, in movements in, in different countries. I mean, it really is international cross-class work that you were doing and it's just, just wish everybody could kind of see and, and, and understand and benefit from that. Um, and Asia, you've, you've worked on, on race within the classroom. Um, I'm sure, I, I don't know if you would have ever experienced it, the sort of, issues that, that, that Stella was talking about there, but within a classroom setting, what are the kind of, um, kind of issues that you would have had to deal with in terms of, I think you, you were working on how race is taught in classrooms. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's, there's, a more, there's a variety of different kind of topics that you can address with talking about race. I think the one thing that everyone has kind of conceded on is that there's, it's so, such big of a topic that there's no one like right way to teach right race in the classroom. But I can kind of just speak to kind of the experience that I had in that there, at least in the African-American, not African-American, in the American sense, we um, learn about race in a very black or white context. It's, it's either you're black or you're white. There's no diversity there. And so when we talk about black history, there's a certain history that's taught, you know, for example, I had one student who was Jamaican and, um, you know, I had my student who was African American at the beginning of the year because, you know, they see a black teacher and they're like, oh my goodness, oh, we're going to learn about black history this year. And she kind of tapped me. She said, can we learn about black history outside of February? And I said, we're going to talk about black history all year. And then my Jamaican student then looked at me and said, well, we're only going to learn about African American history. We're only going to learn about Rosa Parks. We're only going to learn about Harriet Tubman. We're not going to learn about um, Cecil Fatima. We're not going to learn about Nanny and the Maroon. We're not going to learn about any of those figures because that's not what Black means here in this American context. And the same thing with whiteness in that a lot of my students who do identify as white don't really know where to find themselves. Um, you know, a lot of them will say, well, I'm Irish. <laughs> like I, you know, I'm, I, what, you know, what is my whiteness, right? So there is no diversity in terms of the terminologies that we're using. So that's one thing. And then in addition to that, there is a tie into more, and this is an issue that I find, or I have with our education system, is that we kind of teach history in victims, villains, or victors, right? So you have the victors who end up being, you know, the abolitionists who helped to fight slavery, and they're always highlighted. And then you have the victim, the, um, the villains of the slave owners. And then you have the victims who really have no agency at all. You know, we have no highlight of who they are. There's no context to the lives that they lived. It's solely about kind of playing or performative history. And that's kind of, I feel, why when we have conversations such as statues, why when we have conversations such as the legacy of the founding fathers, it's very difficult because a lot of students have been positioned to view history in that way. And there is no room for context. And so that's kind of the issues that I've struggled with in trying to diversify our curriculum in a genuine, honest way. Mm. And that is reflective and that encourages critical thinking. You know, we have, we're having so many conversations. I know in the UK, statues are being tossed in the river. Um, you know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, everyone's kind of we're re renaming things, but there's still no real hard look at the past that positions these 
time periods and not so much figures, but time periods in their proper context. And so those are kind of the issues that I've kind of focused on, on trying to diversify the curriculum that reflects um, really what's happening at the histor you know, in, with historiography. When you look at Black historiography, people have been having these conversations for over a century. Yeah. We've seen this historical research. Why is there such a disconnect between secondary education or work with students in the historical field? When historians talk about education, they talk about talking to university students and then wonder why there are university students or why we, well, why are we having all these conversations about unlearning? Because we have completely neglected this, this, you know, you go through 12 years of your life and then you have to unlearn everything by the time you're 18, when we could just kind of bake that into the curriculum. So that's kind of what I've um, more focused on is trying to provide opportunities for students to really learn not the truth, but the context. Mm. Definitely. I think that that's the same thing uh, um, here as well. I think it, what, it, the education has to start from, from the schools, really. And I think now when a lot of people are saying with Black Lives Matter, what can we do? What can we do? For me, I'll always say, take it back to, to children, take it back to education, because all of the, the politicians of today who are making various decisions, it's all based on their lack of a proper understanding. And, and I, I try to look to this whatever change is going to happen, it's not going to be quick. So by saying we're going to focus on education, it's not that we're not going to deal with things. We are dealing with it maybe more effectively because these are the children who are going to be working in, in the public fields. They're going to be working in decision-making you know, areas. Um, I, I, I'm conscious that it's actually, we were going to take a break. I think I had one more question before we take the break. Oh yes, yeah, so the last question before we take a short break is, um, it, just relating to, to, to Black Lives Matter, do you do both of you feel that that this movement um, has is facilitating a real change for the future? And if so, how do you feel it's doing that in terms of your own work and practice? Let's start first. Um, shall I start? Yeah. Uh, I think those of us who lived through the sixties, seventies, and eighties have a sense that we've been here before. Um, obviously it's not the same. Um, there are new forces at work. There's certainly a lot more white faces on those demonstrations. And, um, you know, it's a different context to 30 years ago, but many of the issues are the same, certainly the issue of police brutality. Um, so is it new? I don't think it's new. I think that What's important is that people who are inspired by Black Lives Matter to get involved and to work for change recognise the important work that has already been done in this field and don't, as you rightly say, try to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, you can go back in London to the days of Ilya, where we had a, like a race equality unit where we spent you know, people were paid to work at developing the curriculum, developing ways of teaching about certain aspects. And I, I wanted to say up front now, I am sick and tired of hearing people talk about black history as if that's the only area of the curriculum that we need to decolonize. The truth is that um, to use Daisha's term, you know, you can hard break this into every subject area um, that we study whether it's mathematics, whether it's science, whether it's architecture, literature, you know that because we've been contributing in all those areas since time immemorial. So um, I think it's really important that we get out of this sense that decolonization within the curriculum context anyway is just about how we teach history. Um, and I say that as a historian, obviously I would love to see a more diverse and more honest approach to the history that's taught in our schools. But I do think it's important. I, I, I know years ago I, I wrote a resource called Trial and Error, which was an attempt to do exactly that, to show teachers that actually if you're teaching maths, you need to acknowledge where algebra came from. Mm -hmm. You need to look at the patterns that are used in African clothing or in hair braiding to see how mathematics worked in that context. You can look at architecture, you can look at artists, so many different ways that you can, you can, you can introduce children into a wider world. And I think that's really important. 
Um, we haven't yet talked about a kick in the belly. Maybe we'll do that later on. But I did want to say that about uh, Black Lives Matters. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I was saying that in another talk this morning about how I think one of the barriers to, to, to curriculum change is that teachers maybe feel like we're, they're being asked to do something, to create something separate, and they're just, or they don't feel confident in teach, teaching what they see as somebody else's story. But once we can show them, as you say, that we're not asking for something different, it's just how you bring out what's already there that people don't know is already there. So what's already there in maths is, as you talked about, algebra, um, what's already there in the English literature is, I think it's more of how you teach what's already there than in terms of introducing new things in all these different curricular areas. Um, Daisha, did you want to, would you like to say something about that as well, about, it was about Black Lives Matter and what you think they'll be the future? Yeah, it's interesting that you started off by saying that you didn't really feel like there was anything, or you feel like you've been there before. And that's, I think I had a large conversation, a long conversation with my sister. Um, and I said, I told her, I said, I think sometimes, especially as a historian, you feel like you live so many different lives <laughs> at the time because you kind of analyze. And I'm like, we've been here before. Um, and so I think what, in terms of what's gonna come out of this moment, I think it's gonna take a lot of looking to the past, but also in terms of education, exactly what you said that, and I think it's not so much even about, okay, well, teachers have to learn how to teach us. No, teachers have to relearn themselves, you know? And I'm saying that even for me as a black woman, I have to relearn, I have to educate myself. I'm consistently confronting texts that are challenging my worldview um, and it's, a, it's important that we go through that process. And I think it's more as a society we have to unlearn. Because I can say, especially as an African-American, the very bones, the very fabric of this country was built on racism. And it has infiltrated every aspect of, of society. There's no way for us to detach it. There is no raceless society that we, there, there we this is what we live in. And so none of us have none of us are clear from its grasp I guess you could say we're all entangled in it and so for us to get to the point of actually seeing more change you have to see like you said that it's in the math curriculum it's in the science curriculum it's the way that we talk it's, it's in the testing that we do it's in the um, access to education that we have everything is tied to it and that can be really all-encompassing for a lot of people because you want a space to detach from it. I know I do. I'm saying that as a Black woman, I wish that there was a space to separate myself from race, but I can't. And so I think that's going to be important. But I also think one thing that the Black Lives Matter prides itself on is collect collectiveness. You can't find, it's always said, you can't find Black Lives Matter, right? There's no, there's no, like you, all these activists are just all over the country. They're all over the world. But I do think that understanding the limitations to collectiveness is going to be important moving forward also. And that's something that you were, that, you know, I saw with OWAD, that's something that I see with a lot of collective movements is that you have to acknowledge that there are differences. And when we talk about Black, who are we talking about? And I think that's something that a lot of people need to start, we need to start having conversations about, which is why I think this, this series is awesome as well. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Daisha. So after the break, I will, I want to talk about uh, your book, So Let a Kick in the Belly, and also your, your play, Her Story, Daisha. So, but during the five minutes when we're not here talking, I wanted to put up a link, which is to our, so, so BCA, we have an, uh, uh, we had a partnership with Google Arts and Culture. Sorry, my phone. <laughs> Throw it away. So we had a, a partnership with Google Arts and Culture where they um, digitized a lot of our collections and have put up 26 exhibitions, one of them about the Black women's movement. And it's like a slideshow, so you can be looking at that while we're, while we're breaking. And maybe think it will help you to think about some of the questions you might want to come up with. So I'm going to put that in the chat. No. Can I just ask a technical question, yes. um, Aisha, while we're, while we're having this break? What I can see is the three of us and a few picture stills and lots of people's names, presumably people um, are listening rather than engaging at the moment, so they're not on screen. Mm -hmm. But I've got um, one of two screens, so I actually have to scroll to another screen to see the other people who are logged on. I think we've got 31 participants. Mm. Is there any way of seeing everybody on the screen at one go? I don't well, think we would be a number of people. We'd be minuscule, wouldn't we, to be able to see each other, perhaps? Yeah, I think you can't do that because of the number of people. You'd okay. have to 
scrolling. Uh, so when you're sharing the discussion and bringing other people in, um, you need to tell us which screen we're looking at as well as who who we're talking to. Yeah, well, I was going to I was going to just like uh, uh, encourage people to put their questions in the chat. But if I mean, if anybody does want to speak in voice, just indicate oh, okay. the chat, and then I can think. Yeah. Okay, so so we need to spend some time looking at the chat as well, do we? No, I'll do that, and I'll, we'll that. I'll share the questions. I, I can't cope with it. Um, no, 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 no. That's what I'm here for. That, that, that's too much multitasking for this time of night. Yeah, that's why my eyes are flickering like this. I'm looking at the chat as well. So um, I've here's the link. So what you can anybody can just click on that and and just scroll through and have a look. And if we, it's my according to my clock. Uh, clock. It's five to well, five to eight in the UK. I mean, it's five minutes to the hour. So shall we convene, uh, reconvene on the hour? Okay. So we can, we can disappear off screen for a minute, can we? We can. And sit down and have a drink. <laughs>
Hiya, we're back. Hi. We're back. Great, welcome back, everybody. So for this last part, I'd like to, to ask both of you about um, your recent work and um, to then open up to, to questions. So Daisha, could you tell us about the, the play that you wrote, The Homegoing, her, her story of, of black womanhood? Can you tell us a bit what it's about? Yeah, so Homegoing kind of was born out of a kind of a journey that I had to go on. Um, I was originally actually an early modern English historian um, studying a lot about royalty. And I, it was actually, it was, I applied for the Fulbright three times. So it was the first time that I had written, um, was filling out my application. I was actually supposed to study English aristocratic women. And for some reason I took a women's studies course and I just started kind of thinking to myself, I know nothing about myself. I know nothing about black women's history. And I actually told myself I wasn't going to submit it. I had this whole breakdown the night before I cried and I listened to, you know, drum music on my way back to my dorm. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to submit it, but I'm going to kind of allow myself to go on this journey of learning more about myself. And so I went through this whole period of months and months and months of looking at Black women's history from, you know, the 1920s, from the 1960s, going back to the Yoruba tradition as an African-American, not having a root on the continent was hard for me. So being able to kind of imagine that. And then I just put it all into a play because I said that I wanted for other women to have that experience, to have a homegoing experience um, mm -hmm. of learning more about themselves and learning more about the past. And um, it kind of just developed from there and kind of trying to reposition women back into our historical focus, mm -hmm. um, whether that's through looking at female lynching, whether that's through looking at resistance movements like um, Stella is doing repositioning ourselves to say that women not only are sidekicks to the story or a good mention or a diversity plug, but we are active participants in the past in which we lived. We lived, we breathed, we resisted, we, that, that we were there. And I wanted to reflect that using the different African modes of communicate, African, um, different forums, different modes of African communication that have always been there through spoken word, through music, through dance, communicating all of that through emotion. And then I wanted my students to have those same experiences. You know, I wanted my students to know about the Orishas of the Yoruba tradition. I wanted my students to know about Nanny and the Maroons. And those are things that I couldn't do in the curriculum. And so kind of creating the internship allowed me to get them involved in that type of history and kind of, you know, have them be, have that be their route rather than the route starting, okay, well, Black people came to America in 1619 and that's it. There was yeah. no path before that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of give them that opportunity. So that's kind of what it was born out of and what it's kind of evolved into now. And I just want to say before, Originally, I only focused on African American women. And so this new journey that I've been on is really trying to understand the context of black women in other areas through OWAD, through, um, you know, the experiences of black women. And that's something I was learning about before Corona. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Before Corona made us all put it on pause. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then so have the students who performed it, it must be it must be really um, emotional on many levels. Have, have, have people indicated how they felt about performing it? Yeah, my friend actually said I've, it's played three times and every single time the, the, the root of it is that you'll never see the same place, the same play twice. So there's always a change. I kind of slip in, slip in scenes and we talk about a lot, but my friend said it's not a play, it's an experience. Mm. Is something that you come in and explain, experience. And I think it's interesting because no matter who you are in the audience, you're impacted by it. Um, for Black women, it might be seeing themselves represented. But I think for white people, it's also seeing themselves represented, it, represented in it, but not being there. Because that's another thing. It's an all Black woman cast. Um, and I did that deliberately because I wanted to focus on Black women without always having this 
white gaze of how white people saw us and oh yeah we have to talk about whiteness here i wanted it for b let's reposition ourselves we're the only people in the story even with black men black men aren't really represented in the play either not because i have an issue with them it's more that i wanted to position us in the center of the story and and you stay there the entire time there it isn't a kind of a clip mm -hmm. um but yeah it's really emotional i love i love i love and it always and there's always a different cast it's great if you're in London, come see it next year. I am. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Thanks, Deja. And and then Stella, your book, A Kick in the Belly, also about um, black women. And um, can you tell us more about about the topics that you that you cover in the book? Okay. Well, I think probably the starting point is the title. Um, a Kick in the Belly is a quote that came from a journal by um, a white planter, an absentee planter called Monk Lewis, Matthew Monk Lewis, mm -hmm. who was, you know, kind of more on the humanitarian side in terms of, of, of that particular group of people. But he kept a diary of his visits to Jamaica. And on one occasion, he visits two plantations that he owns at either end of the island. And on both occasions, he sees um, brutality uh, towards black women. I'm just going to read you the quote because someone kindly wrote it out for me. Um, he says something along the lines of, I have not passed six months in Jamaica and I've already found on one of my estates a woman who'd been kicked in the womb by a white bookkeeper by which she was crippled. And then he refers to another woman whose child was crippled as a result of a similar attack. And he concludes that white, keep, white bookkeepers in Jamaica kick black women in the belly from one end of this island to the other. And I, I thought that was a really important metaphor for uh, the experience of enslaved black women um, across the West Indies and indeed across the Americas, because I don't know about you, but I can't think about being kicked in the belly without a kind of reflexive hug, you know, wishing to protect my stomach. And if you think of the womb or the belly as the locus of, of, of the female -like life cycle in terms of you know, menstruation, procreation, childbirth, menopause, all those things that mark our life cycle. Um, to some extent, you can see being kicked in the belly as, as an attack on every aspect of our lived reality. So I thought it was quite an important way to convey that. And, and uh, that's, that's where the title came from. Mm. But it was also important to me to tell um, not just a hidden story, a story that hasn't been um, told, certainly in a, in a popular arena, but to tell the story warts and all, um, to remind people that we weren't just victims, we were also agents, um, to remind people that um, class came into it and colour gradations and all those other issues that come into the mix when you think about enslavement but most importantly of all I think to kind of counter the narrative that uh, suggests that resistance is a male preoccupation I think most of us have an image of men burning down the cane fields and we forget that some of the most effective resistance took place in the margins it took place in those areas which are were specifically women's domains and I'm talking not just about you know the women who murdered the whole damn family by poisoning the food or um, who, who were active participants in resistance or women who, who, who fled the plantations and joined maroon communities. I'm also talking about women who did small daily acts to subvert the project of slavery and one of the things that comes out in the book um, is how women use reproduction, black women actually use reproduction as a form of resistance. Because if you think about slavery and you think about um, the fact that in 1807, the actual trade itself was, was banned, um, but enslavement continued for many years after that, as soon as that source of new slaves was cut off, then the whole focus was on black women's wombs because without those women reproducing, there were no new slaves. And what you see is some very, very interesting demography around um, that, that, that issue where you see 
every effort being made to encourage black women to breed, you know, amelioration policies, laws passed in parliament, enticements offered, money, um, time off from the fields, all kinds of things done to try to induce women, not just to breed, but also to bring those children to term, to um, breastfeed them for less time than women were doing, um, so that they would breed again. And what you see is the, the birth rate going down, 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 down. But post-emancipation, despite the, the fact that the, the, the plantations were decimated, the, 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 the lying in hospitals where women were meant to give birth, closed down, doctors fled and went back to their countries of origins, and people were basically left to fend for themselves, you see a sudden upswing in the birth rate and a very noticeable one. And you can see that represented not just in Jamaica, but in other parts of the Caribbean as well. So to me, that, that feeds into um, an understanding that women actually used the power that they had, limited as it was, to be extremely effective resistors. And we need to get away from this kind of male Stereo, male dominated stereotype of resistance because resistance comes in all forms. It's an important message now as we resist all the horrors that we're dealing with today. And it's an important message for people who are trying to get their heads around what happened under slavery because it is a very, very male narrative. And one of the, the drawbacks for us as women, I think, is that we've always seen our story told for us by others. We see our story quite often represented through a very racist, very misogynist lens. And by unearthing the stories of women and where possible using the voices of women to tell that story, um, you get a very different perspective. Definitely, and I also think this, this is a, a, a point of comparison again between say UK not UK, well, slavery as it was practiced in the Caribbean, as it was practiced in the US. I think a lot of our understandings in general as a society have been taken from the US plantation system because these are the kind of programs we would have seen mm -hmm. and these are the stories being told. And I, 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 I had a conversation with somebody recently who was trying to say, well, you know, when the slave trade ended, slavery must have been much better because the slaves must have been better treated because it was more in the slave master's interest to to keep the population growing. And I said exactly what you pointed out there, Stella, was that the, in the Caribbean, the slave, the birth rates were, were just dropping and mortality was so high. Whereas if I may be wrong, Daisha, correct me if I'm wrong, but the US maybe did have a more stable and increasing slave population, but, but, but certainly in the Caribbean, it, it was definitely the very opposite. And I think that's another thing to, to, to make sure people understand that-, that yeah, You actually had a very different demography in the US. Yeah. And, um, you know, whereas you can look at Jamaica and see huge plantations with hundreds of slaves, um, when you look at the demography in the US, quite often the slave holdings were quite small. That image that we get from films like Gone with the Wind is actually the exception to the rule. So mm -hmm. um, it's important that we understand the, the nuances and the differences, as well as the similarities in that story and how they're reflected in our modern day understandings, in our modern day existence. I think one of the most important things that I've always taught to my students is actually looking at how many enslaved Africans came where they went. And my students always are surprised. I'm like only six to 8% actually came to the US. And that very much so defined a lot of the US experience is looking at, that, you know, looking at those demographics. Mm. Um, and it's interesting, again, this dominance on the US experience, which I think we can, you know, we've said is um, evident in the curriculum. But it's also, again, in popular culture, people think of US plantations and there's a certain imagery to slavery that mm -hmm. is different. Even if you go, you know, even if we take the Caribbean out of it and we just went to South America, if you go to Brazil, right? How, what, was, what was slave women's activism there? It's important for us to kind of remember, again, looking at those differences um, is important. Um, but yeah, not that many people, not many came here. I think only 400,000 ended up coming to the United States. And a lot of them actually came via the West Indies where they were seasoned and broken in um, and then tr um, transported on. 
So yes, I think it's a it's it's um it's the same, but it's different, and mm. it's important because Hollywood has had such an impact on our uh, notion of what slavery looked like and how it how it was experienced. And actually, you know, when you look at films like Roots, you know, it looks like a children's tea party compared to, for example, um, um, what's his name, um, Haile Garima's Sankofa which looks the experience of women in, 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 in the Jamaican context, very, very different. Very, um, very different. And I think to come to terms with that reality is really important, not because we want to dwell on the horrors or the, make it into some big guilt trip, but because actually it's a story of survival and resistance and resilience that is as important as the story of Jewish people during the Holocaust or any of the other... Uh, stories of resistance that we are raised to respect. You know, the story of people who resisted the French resistance during the war comes to mind. You know, there's all kinds of pockets of examples of, 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 of people who resisted. Um, and it's important that that, that that sense of power and self-worth that comes out of recognizing just the sheer human feat that was involved in surviving that experience. Um, that has to be part of, you know, what we engage with when we talk about the history of slavery. And we really cannot throw that away. I see that a lot, especially when a lot of activists come to school buildings, they always kind of want to, you know, we had the, obviously last year being 1619 and the 400, 400 year commemoration of slavery. I, I experienced a lot of people saying, well, why are we even talking about that? Slavery is, it doesn't matter. Let's not talk about the slaves and I'm not my ancestors, you know? And it's kind of just like, surviving is also a form of resistance. And I think that's especially important when we think about the modern day, when we think about our, do I protest, do I not? Um, are the protesters the only one who are going out? Who's actually fighting? I think it's really important for us to understand that all of us have our place. Mm -hmm. um, and that surviving something is not something to be kind of discounted um, and not to down that story um, because it doesn't fit. Again, what I think is also sometimes, like you said, ma male centered acts of let's only focus on the Haitian revolution. Let's only focus on Nat Turner's rebellion. Let's only focus on these acts of direct violence. Let's talk about how people survive every single day and not only not only survived, but thrived in many ways in terms of developing language, cultural systems. Those are important for us to highlight as well when we talk about slavery and, it, and the legacy of it in our modern day too. Lovely. Thank you both. This has been so fascinating. I can't believe how quickly the, the time has gone and I want to make sure we can address some of the questions which are coming in. Um, and we will also have questions coming in for people watching on Facebook and YouTube. But the first question I see here in the Zoom was, is for you, Daisha, which was, um, how do you work with museums? Do you talk about decolonizing with your students? Um, I think because I saw that question. I think it's really interesting. Titus Kofar um, is probably one of the most inspirational painters that I've ever seen. And he has a portrait of Thomas Jefferson um, and it's kind of a portrait of him and ripped, kind of like shredded down and behind him is Sally Hemings. And I think kind of to speak to that, and I'm, we have a black art um, session that's gonna be coming up in about two weeks. But I think that in terms of decolonizing the narrative it's not only positioning blackness back into the, black into the archive, it's also re, kind of relearning what we've already learned, right? So just because you add I don't know, Beyonce next to George Washington, that doesn't really change George Washington, does it? it just because we're added, it's not so much about, like Joy DeGroy says, um, it's not so much about me being there. It's about you learning about you, right? And so I think decolonizing, again, there's an unlearning and it has to be a verb. Decolonizing has to be a verb, but that's active, that you're active in, not just, okay, well, black people are there. So I think that's what's important when we think about museums. Um, and what their, their purpose is in, in, in their role in racism. Aisha, I mentioned that I worked on the Mayor of London's Commission, where we looked at heritage organisations across London and how they might, uh, we didn't use the term decolonise in those days, but how they might diversify and more 
accurately reflect London's diversity. And I was quite shocked by how many curators and archivists really didn't um, get it. They'd say, we don't know enough about this history. We don't feel confident. We don't feel um, it was part of our training, whatever. They had all these excuses. And I think part of the <coughs> problem is, I'm gonna be quite controversial here. I think part of the problem may be that we, we keep referring to this entity, black history, mm. as if it dropped from another planet, as if it's something out there that is separate to everybody else's history. I far prefer the term hidden history because there are so many people who've been hidden from history, so many groups. Um, women are just one of many that we could name. Um, and if we think about history in, in, in terms of what's been hidden, rather than some separate group having a separate story, then I think it's far easier to um, imagine integrating that history um, and to stop talking about Black History Month, White History Year, because that's really what's going on in the curriculum. You know, they have this little flurry of activity where they focus on a few individuals mm. um, and then it's back to um, the status quo, back to uh, normality, which is basically, um, you know, the odd exotic mention. <laughs> So, yes, in terms of your question, that question about how you work with universities, uh, with, with museums, rather, I wanted to say that part of it is about, you know, uh, putting a rocket up the, um, I won't say it online, you know, of people who, who somehow think that it's not within their gift to address mm -hmm. these issues. But it's also about recognising the role of museums. Um, I had a friend years ago who wrote, who made a small play, a, a small film, I think it was called You Hide Me. And he went down into the basement of the British Museum and started filming all these artifacts that had been stolen by Colonel Bloggins or whoever in the Ashanti Wars. Fantastic things that had been stolen from us and then stuck in plastic bags. And, um, you know, for me, actually, when we talk about deinstitutionalizing the racism in the heritage sector, we're actually talking about the staffing, we're talking about the training of archivists, museums, we're talking about returning the artifacts to their rightful place. We're talking about training people to overcome some of the very practical difficulties that we have in our countries of origin because of tropical climates, for example, that can deteriorate things much quicker because of the erratic electricity supplies that make it difficult to maintain you know, a, a, a standard environment. There's a whole complex discussion to be had around decolonizing the museums that goes beyond just sticking Beyonce next to George Washington. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Stella. The next question is, um, let's see. Okay, so we've got four more questions and we've got seven minutes. So um, the next question is, is, is to Daisha about what made you decide to engage with Black British history and other experiences from groups of the diaspora that you did not hear as much about growing up in the US? Yeah, like I said, I, I think um, just to kind of put it simply, it, it just, I wanted to understand Blackness in a different context, but it also was just really inspiring to feel as if I wasn't alone in the world. Um, and I and I and I like I said, I, reading the newsletters of Fowad, kind of bringing it back to Owad, I, I can't really describe how impactful that movement had, and not just Owad, but all the other the South Hall sisters. Looking at all of that activism, it just made me feel like, wow, we've always been together in some sense. And I think for many people, there are a lot of notions of I'm a Pan-Africanist or I, I'm a part of, you know, what does a Pan-African dream look like? And I think instead of kind of, it kind of helped me to see that that's always been there. That, that notion of wanting to unify has always been a part of the Black experience or again, what the Black experience means. So I think that's what really helped. And also I just, I, I, I lived in England. I've always kind of, um, been tied to it in a way because in many ways, whenever I had lived in Plymouth in 2014, I didn't really understand what black meant until I came to England. And so having that experience kind of forever tied that 
with me. Um, and so being able to learn about what Black meant there during the second journey was really important. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I just think that it's going to be important for us to continue this, these conversations so that we don't always, we don't all feel alone or, oh, my experiences aren't really reflected. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tasha. Uh, Stella, there's a question from, uh, yeah, it's saying, incredible to see women's power to resist by controlling the future yeah. with their bodies. Was this understood at the time as a form of resistance or was it seen as a medical or practical issue that could be dealt with? I.e., was the women's agency, was the women's agency in this action disregarded? Um, no, it wasn't. What's very interesting when you look at some of the parliamentary debates that took place around the whole issue of amelioration and also abolition is the comments of white politicians and the West India lobby representatives who acknowledged the fact that the birth rate was declining and because they were seeing this history through that racist misogynist lens um, put it down to black women couldn't be bothered to have children because it got in the way of their licentious behavior um, black women were self-aborting well Actually, how did they do that? They did that because some woman came naked on a ship with an understanding of the plants and herbs and yams and other things that they could use to create an abortion, an abortion in the absence of any European medical input. Um, and there's a whole body of work around um, a very uncomfortable subject, infanticide, um, and probably it's best represented in the words of a woman who's, who's referred to in the kick in the belly, um, Sabrina Park, who was hung. She was taken to court and sentenced to death for um, putting her own child to death. And her comment as she came down the steps of the courthouse is that she would not be bothered to bring a child into slavery to work for Massa. So I think it is true that obviously not all women would have been conscious that this is what they were doing. They might have had other reasons in their head for not wishing to, to become just breeding machines. But certainly there were some women who were very conscious that they did not want to support this project. And um, that comes out in all kinds of ways, both, both subtle and overt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And does your book have a US release date as well? Okay. I have no idea. I think that's the sort of question you could certainly um, contact the person publishers. and ask them about. I know yeah. there is going to be an audio book. I heard that recently. So um, I think if you went on the Verso website, that sort of information should be available. And if not, you'd be able to email them and ask. Okay. I know it's due out in October in Black History Month here. And um, I do know that because of COVID, there will be quite a few launch events online similar to this. I'm, I'm very much hopeful that we can have some debates with um, Liverpool and Bristol slavery museums mm -hmm. and um, have some forums which are, you know, transatlantic and which will allow us to continue the discussion about um, a kick in the belly and what it represents. So look out mm -hmm. for that. Okay. I wonder if I'm going to I'm going to read out the last two questions and, and because I don't know if there's time to address them both. Um, so the, there's a question for both of you, which is um, following on from the black monologues comments. Have you found non-binary stories and modes of resistance in the period of enslaved Africans? That's the first question. Second one is thinking about the body as having a resistive agency. How do we liberate and decolonize the body and what this means for the complex breaking down of ideas about gender and or ancestral trauma? I'm sorry, they're quite long questions. So do you want to repeat them or break them down? <laughs> okay. Um, so one is a question about uh, if there's any non-binary stories and, uh, uh, and mode, non stories of non-binary and modes of resistance in the period of, of enslaved Africans that either of you have come across. I did come across a few and I would have to go back to my notes and my references to, to reference the person who did it. But I know I came across a couple of articles written by women who are particularly interested in unearthing some of those stories. So it is out there. Um, 
I think the only justice I could do to that that question really is to go back to my notes and perhaps post that information up at some point when I can actually reference who, who it was that, that I'm talking about. But I found some stuff in the British Library and, um, you know, again, as with all these hidden histories, it's a case of really having to unearth the stories and read between the lines and listen to the music behind the words. But those stories are definitely there. And I would imagine that in a context where love and, you know, human comfort was in such short supply that many women would have found ways of loving each other and, um, you know, not so necessarily me. coming to, 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 the, to the expectations of how they should behave sexually. Mm -hmm. Sure, and, and just to add in on that, I think um, it, I think a lot of um, kind of touching on how we get at those, and not so much hidden stories, but because in, in many ways they're hidden in plain sight, because there's always been, um, there have always been non-binary people, there's always been trans people, and they've always been a part of history. Um, I think it's more just about us taking a look at the archive and again, having more it's going to take a lot of revolution in the archive is what I would, I, I would say. Um, and like I said, I, I, for me, um, I can just say for me, I, I've been trying to do more research on um, non-binary and trans voices for my play that I'm actually in the works of doing. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that's what I'll say. Great. Um, I think we'll have to, to, to leave the other question there because we have absolutely run out of time. But I just want to thank both of you, Daisha and Stella. It's been a really, really fascinating discussion. And I hope that this is, again, this is this is um, part of our uh, Bridging Atlantic series, which, which next week we'll be talking about um, black liberation, black power movements, and so on. Um, in fact, Daisha, maybe you want to quick, uh, say something quick about the other Yes, so next week um, you can register via Eventbrite. We're actually going to be speaking to um, a couple of uh, some organizers, um, not only from London, but also from New Haven, Connecticut. So we're going to be kind of looking at a kind of looking at the transatlantic experience of the Black Power movement and looking again at what Stella was talking about, those international connect, um, co connections um, next week. Um, and then also, if you want to join, I'm going to be dancing on Saturday. I'm teaching a beat class. It's called Beat, um, where we're going to be, I'm just going to be, we're going to dance some dias diasporic dances um, to a beat. I'm going to sweat a lot. I might embarrass myself, but it's going to be fun. So um, if you want to be a part of that, please um, register via the Eventbrite link as well. And also keep in mind um, to think about um, donating to the BCA and the work that, um, you know, it takes to kind of keep these discussions and keep that that work happening and i'm going to be sending out a survey for everyone to complete please fill that out because it helps us with the um, organizing since this is a continuous event um, that data helps Lovely. thanks a lot daisha and i've just posted a very long link to, to some of, of stella's works i did mention at the beginning i was going to do that so people can can continue with their okay and if i do unearth that reference or those references that i referred to if i just pass them on to you asia will you be able to post them up Yep, definitely. Okay. okay, I'll do that. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank Good you. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>